Okay. Well, good morning once again. Uh, welcome to our Christmas season of services. Uh, Christmas is a season, but it is also life. Uh, and so often we live it as just the Christmas season. But it is so much more than that. It is, it is a season that should last an entire lifetime. And you take today and you do Christmas as a season of joy. And uh, joy is the third candle of the uh, Advent season. And it's, a, it's something that, you know, like peace last week, is, is sometimes hard to explain. You know, we, we've, especially in, in a year like this year where we've had all of this, and I hate this word right now, I really don't like it at all, unprecedented. You know, it's like every time you turn on the news or you pick up a newspaper or you turn the radio on, we're in an unprecedented state in our day. No, we're not. We're in a time when things are not going the way we would like them, but it is not unprecedented. And yet, through all of this, we can have joy. I see joy every day in the smiles on faces. And yes, you can see smiles through masks. You can see it, you know, we see it in Santa Claus all the time. You know, what do we talk about when we talk about Santa Claus has got this great big bushy beard on, and what's one of the greatest ways to describe Santa Claus? He had a twinkle in his eye. And we all still have that. We have to look past what is right in front of us to what our future holds. And a future with Jesus Christ in the world when he came is far more glorious and far deserving of our rejoicing and our joy than mumbling under our mask about what's coming down the pipe and what's going to happen next. With God, there is an ever-present life that we will have, regardless of what happens here. We have eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ, who came to us to be Emmanuel, our God with us. And knowing that, that God was willing to come down here in spite of all of the garbage that's going on, all of the war, all of the violence, all of the killing. You know, when we talk about old times, we use the words death and pestilence. All of that stuff going on, and yet he came down so that we could have a life with him. So that we could rejoin him in heaven. And that in itself should be able to bring an ever present joy when we think about it. See, and there's, we get mixed up in this world with words. We've, we've, we've gotten in a bad habit over centuries of time. And it's really seemed to have escalated in, in this last century or so, last 50 years, of changing the meaning of words. And that's actually not supposed to say hope, it's supposed to say happiness versus joy. Um, not sure what I, why I typed hope, but probably because I have eternal hope through Jesus Christ. Um, but happiness versus joy. Happiness and joy are not the same thing. There's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is an emotion that is fleeting. It comes and it goes. We have our good days and our bad days. You know, when you, when you turn 16 and your dad pulls up in a 1967 candy apple red Mustang and says, Here, dear, happy birthday. That was happiness. It was not joy. Though people may have described you as joyful, that's happiness. Because eventually you have to sell that car. 
in lieu of a minivan because now you have two kids and all of that stuff that goes on with it. Joy, on the other hand, joy is this feeling that remains. It's constantly there with us. We could call it an emotion, but it's an emotion that doesn't end. We may not be happy. We may be sorrowful and crying our eyes out or angry and yelling and screaming. But we still have joy. It's that feeling that no matter what other emotion we may be feeling at the time, it's knowing that things are going to be okay. No matter what happens because of this sadness in my life or this, this discomfort that I'm feeling, God is taking care of me. You see, without God, you can't have true, everlasting, and ever-present joy in your life. Trust me, I know. I've been there. I told that story a couple weeks ago. But it's kind of like one of, one of our favorite children's stories. I don't think a kid has ever gotten through life without hearing this story. The Princess and the Pea. Think about what her life was like. She went to bed one night and couldn't sleep because there was some discomfort in her life. She had a beautiful feather mattress, the best that money could buy. But she had this, hey, you're not happy. You're not filled with joy. See, I, I just did it. I misused the word. You can't find joy and comfort and peace because of this pee. And no matter what she did, she piled mattress on mattress on mattress on top of each other, trying to get to find that joy that she could sleep. But she never found it. Trying everything else in the world except the one thing that could get her sleep going to the source. And if she had lifted up and looked at her life, lifted, lifted up that mattress to begin with, and examined what was going on, she would have realized that this thing was causing her problems. And God is that same way. He's sitting there, he's telling you, giving you those directions, but are you hearing it? Are you willing to do what needs to be done to change? Are you, that, you know, that's the big thing. She wasn't willing to change. She thought, I'm, I'm a princess. I don't have to do anything else. I just have to keep bringing this stuff in. But no matter what we do as people, we cannot find, we cannot produce that joy that is unexplainable. That joy that we have in knowing that Christ came and sacrificed himself so that I could stand before God. And another uh, story that I read recently, a young boy was back in the Depression Young boy found out that the circus was coming to town. And he was just so excited. But he couldn't, he didn't have the money to go see it. Obviously, you know, his dad was out of work, it was the depression. He didn't have the money to give him. But his dad told him, if you can earn part of that money, I'll help you out. So the boy went out that week and Picked up garbage, mowed lawns, did you know, all these little things for people. He earned about half the money he needed, and his dad gave him the other half. So happy, he ran down to the park, bought his ticket to the circus, and then ran downtown to see the parade. Watched the parade, he was having a great time laughing and joking with a clown. He handed that clown his ticket 
And when the parade was over, he ran back home and told his dad, oh my gosh, dad, it was so great. I got to see the circus. It was so wonderful. And I mean, the kid was just smiling from ear to ear. And dad realized that he hadn't seen the circus yet because he was only gone for an hour or two. And he should have been gone most of the day. And, and he had to take his son and say, hey, Johnny, you didn't see the circus. You just saw the parade. You, you missed the main event. How many people have missed the main event by not knowing Christ, not understanding that he actually came down from heaven, became one of us, So that we could become one with him. So that we could stand before God and not have to worry about what life was going to deal out. So that we could find joy and peace and hope. Despite all of this other stuff that was going on around us. All of our emotions. And that's that, that's the point. Christmas is a great season. And I don't, I very rarely, I mean, yes, you've got your bah humbugs. But even those bah humbugs usually will crack a smile and do a nice thing at some point during these five weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And it kind of trickles on a little bit into the new year. Everybody finds some kind of joy during the season. But they miss the point. They hand their ticket to the clown instead of handing, instead of going to actually see and participate in the show. Christ and his arrival is great, brings great joy because it's good news. Good news for sinners. And I'm sorry, I may step on a few toes with this, but I don't care who you are, from the brand new baby, just born, to the Pope in Italy, or the Dalai Lama, or whomever, you've sinned. You're a sinner. We all are. But thank goodness we have Christ who came so that we can overcome that sin and have that joy that is found in his, in his birth and in his life. There's nothing that brings more joy than a baby being born. You know, those of us who are parents and grandparents understand that feeling that first time you get to hold that brand new baby. You know, this world is living much like the shepherds were that night. Think about it. Here they are, sitting on a, sitting on a hillside outside of Bethlehem, minding their own business, you know, some of them in the tent sleeping, a few of them around the campfire keeping warm. And all of a sudden, bam, this big blast of light comes out of the sky, and Gabriel is sitting there in the heavens going, fear not, I bring great news. I don't know about you, but I probably would have been cleaning my clothes if that happened to me. Just saying. And yet these shepherds, these shepherds, they were the, they're the lost human race. They are out in the darkness. And the angel comes to them and they experience the glory of God through this angel. The, the light and the joy and, the, and the, the, the trumpet sounding and the sound of the choir and you know, all of that that we imagine when you think of God blasting into the world. 
Bam, da, da, da. And here he is. And that can be scary. The first time you actually have a direct revelation from God. Sometimes we recognize him, sometimes we don't. It's scary that first time you feel his hand on your shoulder. That, that physical presence of him. Or you hear, actually hear him whispering in your ear. That's, what? Wait a minute. What's going on? I'm here alone. What was that voice? But the presence of God is joyful for you. When he comes to you specifically like he did to those shepherds and shines that light on your life, you shouldn't be afraid. It should be great news that you do like the shepherds did and shout it. Bring it to the people. That light shows us the path. All of a sudden now you can see the dangers in your life when you have the light of God shining on you. Nobody wants to be in the dark. The dark is a scary place. So when the lights come on, it's like, <gasps> yay, light. That's what God did that day, that night. Jesus is the light of the world and brings us this joy. And there's too few people that don't understand because they're in the darkness still. They don't have the light. They don't understand the wrath of God that is impending without the light, without the joy of, of Jesus' birth. His birth is the best news this world has ever had. Bigger than the day Russia put Sputnik into the world, into, the, into orbit. Bigger than the day Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon. Bigger than the end of World War I or World War II. Even bigger than our own revolutionary war. Because the birth of Jesus brings a joy that we can't find anywhere else. It, brings, it gives us hope and peace to go along with it. Because of the promise of eternal life. We can be happy. We can express that joy even when we're not in a good situation, because we know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. The coming of Jesus Christ allows us to be in the presence of God. Without that, we can't be in his presence. We can't stand before him. We would still have to go to the priest, just like the Israelites had to do, and say, hey, this is what happened. I need you to take this before God and come back and tell me what to do. No. But with Jesus, we can go directly to God and say, God, I blew it. Or God, I'm in a situation that I don't know what to do. Give me direction. Help me. And we can have that conversation with him. Jesus' arrival brings great joy because it is true. There's a lot of people out there that are going to tell you, no, it ain't. But Jesus is here. Jesus was born. History shows us that. The more people try to disprove his birth, his ministry, and his resurrection, the more they discover they can't disprove it. And it should bring joy, unlike this guy. Volume.
Fake lottery winners. Sorry, I meant to stop that before. The beep. People try and find their joy in all these other things. You know, this guy was trying to find it in money. You know, there's a reason that scripture says money is a root of all evil. It can't bring you joy. You know, the Beatles were right. Money can't buy you love. Jesus' birth is no more than a joke if it isn't true. A root joke. And if you don't want to believe scripture, I offer this, this little bit of a history lesson to you. See, Luke was a doctor. And we don't know a doctor of what, but we're all assuming a medical doctor because there weren't a whole lot of degrees being handed out back then. But he did not like things that he couldn't prove them. He was a scientist. He wanted to know for sure. And when he wrote his gospel, he did his due diligence to make sure what he wrote was right and true. Many believe he got his version, which by the way is the only full version of the birth story in scripture. Many believe he got that directly from Mary. That she gave him all of his information about it. Now why would a group of poor shepherds, who by the way were the, the outcasts of society, they were, on, they were the ones who lived on the other side of the tracks. Why would they have a reason to fabricate this story? <coughs> Excuse me. You know, if you're going to make up a story about the Messiah, wouldn't you make up one about a warrior savior who's just been born? This child is going to grow up to be our, our great warrior. You're not going to you're not going to fabricate a story about a kid who's born in a shepherd in a manger, placed in a feeding trough for his first crib. There's countless other stories and evidence that has been uncovered by by historians and by archaeologists over the years that serve to prove the truth of Scripture including the birth of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's impossible to shrug off the life of Jesus as a nice story that is only true if you choose to believe it. Whether you choose to believe it or not, it happened. It is reality. And it should bring great joy because it is true. There's great joy because the news of, of this birth is the news of Emmanuel. The news of Christ the Lord coming to be with us. Jesus was a different person. He wasn't like you and I. And sure, he had skin and bone and two arms, two legs. Pulled his tunic up over the top just like the rest of us. Buckled his sandals, you know. Left and right or right and left. But he was conceived by God, not man. So he is Christ. He is the chosen one, anointed by God for a special job. But he is also Lord. Remember before he left? His disciples, his last words to them, all authority has been given to me. God has turned over the keys to the kingdom to Jesus. He is our Lord and our Savior. And all through all of this, being God, coming to earth, going back to God, he was man, just like you and I. But not like you and I. He is very unique in who he is and what he did. 
And finally, you should find it should be joyful news. And then cut and paste is a wonderful thing only if you fix it. That should read great joy because it is for all people. All people. So the angel told the shepherds in verse, in chapter, in verse 10 of chapter 2. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I will bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Not just those of us who come to church every Sunday, or if, you're, if you have to, watching church every Sunday on TV or listening to it on the radio. But even for those who don't come to church, who don't believe right now, he came for them. He came for all of us. Even as sinners, he came for us. Paul wrote in Romans, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's in Romans chapter 10, verses 11 through 13. I close today with a, with a short story called The Christmas Tree. Again, a story about a family uh, from Pittsburgh, of the Pittsburgh area, anyway, Pennsylvania. Uh, family, father was uh, employed by a steel mill nearby, and unfortunately, you know, the, every year he would bring home, on Christmas Eve, he would bring home gifts for everybody. And, and bring home the Christmas tree. And they would decorate it and, and open their presents. And everybody was just in really good spirits. And one day he got laid off. Lost his job. The mill closed. That Christmas was a hard Christmas. They didn't know what to do. The kids, they, I mean, they understood they, they, that they weren't going to get presents. So dad decided he was going to do something about this. He promised them that at the very least he would bring them a Christmas tree. So he went out to his shop, out back, out to the garage, grabbed a couple of old two by fours, nailed them together, drilled holes down the four sides, put it on a stand. Then he went down uh, down the street, there was a, a neighbor down the street who had this great big row of pine trees along one border of their house. And he asked them if he could cut some of the smaller branches from, from a few of the trees so that he could build this, this tree, Christmas tree for his family. They agreed. They said, yeah, go ahead. That's not a problem. So he cut these branches, went home, stuck them in the holes, and made probably what could be considered the ultimate Charlie Brown Christmas tree. And while it wasn't, well, I mean, you could look at it and you knew it wasn't a tree. When he brought it in the house, the kids were elated that they at least had something for Christmas. Some part of their Christmas past could be celebrated. So they got out their box of ornaments and garland and tinsel and decorated this tree and, and were pleased and, and joyful despite the circumstances they were in. And as they finished, knock came on the door and standing there as, as dad opened the door was this great big blue spruce Christmas tree. And a voice behind the tree said, we'd like you to have this Christmas tree. It's our gift to you. So they took the tree. Lo and behold, it was the neighbor from down the street. 
and they accepted it and they thanked them. And they were just, I mean, the, the joy that they felt from that was even more than the joy they felt with dad trying to satisfy what was going on. The lady who lived this years later would say every time she walked past that house, she would see about halfway down the road this one empty spot in the row of trees. And it would remind her of her father and of her family and of the joy that they had at that Christmas, despite everything else. That the goodness of those people brought them joy. God's the same way. Can you imagine the, the emptiness that he felt in his heart after sending his son here and then having to essentially cut him down? See, a, a gift refused is lost joy. That family could have refused that gift of that tree, but they didn't. When you receive a gift from somebody, it brings joy to you, but it also brings joy to the person giving it. They feel good for you, you feel good for you, and you both feel good. It's, just, it's, a, it's a mutual joy fest. Imagine God's feelings when people reject his gift. When he gives you the gift of life in Jesus Christ and you reject that. Imagine how he feels. And the joy that you miss out on because of that. To have the joy of Christ requires that you accept his gift. That you say to God, thank you. And you take that gift and you use it in your life. Just as that family did. They used that gift in their life. They took that tree in. They took the decorations off the tree that dad gave them. And they decorated this, this the real tree. Their real winnings, if you will as opposed to the fake lottery winnings that Sean was getting in the video. And they found that joy. That tree very probably kept on giving through the Christmas holiday. After they took the decorations down and off, they probably cut it up and used it for firewood to heat their house or for any number of other things. Are you ready to accept the gift that is from God? The gift of Jesus Christ? The gift of joy? The gift of peace? As it says in John chapter 14, my peace I live with you, I give you, not as the world gives, but I give a perfect peace, a perfect joy that we can each have. Christmas is a season for joy. A, se a season to celebrate, a, a, a season of life that should continue beyond these five weeks. Heavenly Father, I pray. I pray that this joy can continue beyond the 25th. That, that people can experience this joy in your mom. That they can feel it no matter where they're at. Standing in line at the driver's license facility. Whatever they're doing. Wherever they're at. Waiting on that parking spot or I don't know. Just any moment. Whether it's a happy moment or a bad, a sad or an angry moment. That they can they can find that joy that is Christmas. That we can have your spirit 
your Holy Spirit in every circumstance, even when you can't, even when we can't get comfortable because something is pressing into our side, that we can pull back that mattress and find the pea and find you. And we know that with Jesus Christ, we have you present in our lives taking care of us, bringing us hope, peace, and joy. We ask this in prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our light and your Son. Amen. Well, I hope you have a great week this week. Um, find joy in everything. And give joy to everybody. Have a blessed week. Merry Christmas.